the men were on the military test place didn't like at first that a, that a, that a girl were flying there because it was a man's job at this time. But when they saw that I silently in one corner where I thought nobody would see me made, every day from very great height, my vertical dive with bombers and stukas and so on, to test air brakes from all different military types. On landing her stuka at Rechlin after one such test flight, she was told by Karl Franke, the chief test pilot, that he was going to Bremen to test fly Germany's first helicopter, designed by Professor Fokker. And he asked me if I would like to bring him there with my most beloved bomber. This was the Dornier Do 17. When we arrived at Bremen, Professor Fokker received us and was very astonished I was at this time already with 24 years a flight captain. Um, he said, oh, it's wonderful that Hanno Reich also comes to test fly the helicopter. And you see the helicopter, this first helicopter, seemed in the whole world to be a miracle. So I looked to Frank and he only twinkled with his eyes. So I thought, thank you, thank you. I asked to make a circle and I put the plane in the middle I could look to see the wheel. Now, when giving gasoline, I saw when the stick wasn't just in the middle, the wheel went forward. And when, when I went the stick a little bit backwards, the wheel went backwards. So when I found, now the wheel is standing, I gave gasoline, with the gasoline, it went up. I went down again. Within three minutes, I had it. The FA-61 was undoubtedly the world's first practical helicopter. But at that time, there remained the problem of how to present this achievement to a skeptical world. You see, when the newspapers in the whole world wrote about this first miraculous uh, uh, helicopter, uh, we had already so many enemies that they didn't believe it. And if Germany would have invited them, they wouldn't have come. So very clever, General Udet thought, we will, in, we will without inviting them have them all. The occasion was the Berlin International Motor Show, an annual display of German technological skill, which naturally attracted the world's press. And this time, 1938, he thought, we will show the helicopter. And Hanna had to demonstrate this. After this brief rehearsal, Hanna Reich, for the two week duration of the show, nightly performed the hazardous flight inside the Deutschlandshalle, where the smallest fault or error of judgment could have ended in disaster. With the primitive controls then available, such an accident could well have occurred but all went well and it was so clever of General Udet because due to this it remained an historical fact that Professor Fock's helicopter was really the very first in the history of mankind, yes? But the history of mankind was about to record the outbreak of the Second World War. Hermann Goering reviews men of his Luftwaffe in 1939, by far the most powerful air force in the world, and which was to spearhead the Blitzkrieg, Lightning War, which used air power and armor to crush Poland, the Low Countries, and France in a matter of weeks. In achieving this, many new military concepts were employed, parachute and airborne troops, and perhaps the most innovative of all, the brilliant first use of glider-borne assault troops to capture a vital Belgian fort in 1940. Following the success of the small 10-man glider, a larger machine was produced and test flown by Hanna Reich. This glider, the Goethe 242, could carry 21 fully armed men or be used on supply missions. It was by Allied standards a large glider, but it was soon to be dwarfed. Willy Messerschmitt, the head of the company bearing his name, had been ordered to design and produce a glider capable of carrying a tank or no fewer than 200 fully armed men. 
two hundred of these enormous gliders were to be immediately constructed for Operation Sea Lion, the 1940 invasion of Britain. The gliders, the largest ever built, were only slightly smaller than a present-day jumbo jet. They were given the appropriate name Gigant, Giant. Incredibly, the prototype was ready just 14 weeks after the design was finalized. The test pilots, among them Hannah Reich, flew the aircraft from this single narrow cockpit 60 feet above the runway. A Junkers 90, one of the few four-engined aircraft the Germans possessed, towed the prototype Gigant on its first test flight at Lifeline. Halfway down the mile-long runway, hydrogen peroxide rockets were ignited to assist the hard-pressed Ju-90. The first hurdle, jettisoning the two-ton undercarriage, was cleared without incident and the Gigant was airborne. But Hannah Reich, after test flying the prototype, was far from impressed. It was so primitively built that it was so difficult to fly. You needed so much strength. And you see, this what is too hard for me in a five minutes flight, that is too hard for a strong man in a one hour flight. So I tried with this argument to convince Udit to stop it. But he didn't believe it because Messerschmitt said, she is a too small a little girl, but not a strong man for fighting. So don't believe her. They didn't. The test flights continued, though Hannah Reich and other pilots confirmed that in addition to the heavy controls, the Junkers tow plane was seriously underpowered and barely able to maintain flying speed on takeoff. Once airborne, the Gigant, despite its size, flew surprisingly well though the controls, even for a strong man, were almost immovable. Hannah Wright found that she could fly the aircraft only by using the trim wheels, which must have made her landing approach critical. But she managed without obvious difficulty to land the huge glider, gently easing it down onto its unsprung skids. the landings being satisfactory, it was eventually decided to try to improve the takeoffs by returning to an original proposal by Messerschmitt himself of using four towing planes. In the event, only three were to be used, twin-engined Messerschmitt 110s, totaling 8,850 horsepower. Long steel tow cables were attached to the glider and the Troika Schlepp, as it was called, began its first test flight. takeoff was in many ways difficult, for despite the rocket assistance, the three towing aircraft were teetering on the edge of stalling. The whole operation called for extremely skilled, coordinated flying on the part of all the pilots concerned. The smallest error would have been disastrous. And disasters there were. On one test flight, the glider's rockets fired on only one wing, dragging the Troika together. The three tow planes and the glider crashed. 129 troops on board the glider were killed. Hannah Reich, on her second test flight, had trouble with a Troika schlep. The left bomber, even when still being on the ground, or just above the ground, went out. He had to release the cable, and two couldn't tow it alone. We had six rockets on the wing, which when they once were blowing, you could not stop them. So when you lost one towing bomber, also the right bomber was lost. I was hanging on one bomber that was 
like a little fly compared with my dime. And all six rockets were burning. I knew I couldn't stop it. I could get 150 feet high. Then the rockets were finished after three minutes or four. And I knew the, the, the single tow bomber had to release me, otherwise he would... So I could just, when he released me, and I could release all three ropes. And so before the ground, I touched the ground. It was like this, but I, we had the good luck that I just, it was only good luck, touched the ground when the ground makes such a wave. So one had broken his knees, another had a nerve shock, but you see, I was, I was well. Mm, and only deeply thankful that nobody was killed and I finished because I was so much against it because it was too big. As gliders, the gigants were not a practical proposition. So they were fitted with six engines and a multi-wheel undercarriage to become the largest service transports in existence. And one of them was tested by Hannah Reich. Oh, this was very simple to fly, you see. The engine did it a view not generally held by Luftwaffe pilots. These sticking plaster bombers, as the German soldiers disparagingly called them, proved easy prey for Allied fighters, and many were shot down. Powered gliders were not new. As early as 1932, the German scientist Opel fixed solid fuel rockets to this small glider to achieve tentative rocket-powered flight. By 1941, the idea had been developed into the Messerschmitt 163. This diminutive delta-winged fighter was designed by Dr. Lippisch and powered by an incredibly efficient liquid-fueled rocket. The prototype, flown by Heine Dittmar, took off from Karlshagen at Pienemunde in 1941. On becoming airborne, the undercarriage was jettisoned and the aircraft demonstrated an amazing rate of climb. Later, Dietmar was towed to altitude to conserve fuel when he achieved 623 miles per hour, easily breaking the existing world speed record though naturally this was not claimed due to wartime security. During that record-breaking flight, Heine Dittmar probed the edges of what was later to be called the sound barrier. Heine Dittmar was not the only test pilot to fly the 163. Hannah Reich also test flew one of the early models from the Messerschmitt airfield at Lechfeld, and she later flew a more powerful version, now named Comet, which made a great impression on her. And I can only tell you, it was fascinating. It was like thundering through the skies, sitting on a canoe ball, like being intoxicated by speed. It was not difficult to uh, fly it. It was only an overwhelming impression. At the end of the airfield, of the airfield boundary, you already reached about 500 miles per hour and with constant speed you were climbing up in one and a half to two minutes into a height of 30,000 feet. Exhilarating though it undoubtedly was, after six minutes the comet's rocket fuel was exhausted and the world's fastest fighter became the world's fastest glider, which called for extremely accurate flying. Fuel used by the comet consisted of Seestoff and Tischtoff. They were basically methanol alcohol and hydrogen peroxide, which are highly incompatible. A few drops of one on the other produced a violent reaction. Tischtoff was capable of spontaneous combustion when in contact with any organic material. which, of course, included the pilot. In view of the nature of the fuel, Hannah Reich, like all Comet pilots, had special protective clothing. 
but despite this protection, some pilots were dissolved alive by the murderer's fuel. Hannah Reich well remembers the dangers of test flying the Messerschmitt comets. I experienced two comrades blowing to pieces when their plane exploded. On one of Hannah Reich's test flights, as she was towed into the air, the undercarriage refused to jettison. I couldn't get rid of it. At the same time, this often happens when you have an accident that many things at the same time go out of work. So all electrical operating instruments were kaput, um, also the landing flaps, and so many, and also the radio connection with the tow pilot and with the ground. So it was difficult to uh, let the tow pilot know that I wanted to come into a great height. So for 10 minutes, he circled uh, in a height of about um, uh, uh, nine, uh, 900 feet. Um, but I stubbornly remained on the rope and suddenly, and I only watched when, they, uh, when the ambulance and the stretcher and the fire truck and all it came to receive me, and I thought, said, oh, I hope I will come quite safely down. But suddenly, uh, the tow pilot went up to uh, 9,000 feet, and I released the cable, and I tried with positive and negative G Gs to get rid of the undercarriage, but I felt that it, I didn't succeed. But I hope to bring this um, test plane to the ground safely because such a test uh, plane has many many uh, valuable instruments and um, but because all electrical operating instrument didn't work uh, also not the landing flaps um, the last side slip I had to come to approach the airfield in a greater height as normally in order to be sure that you will reach the place and you had then to lose high with the cautious side slip but this destroyed the whole airflow because it was only wing without tail plane it came out of control and crashed in the field that was completely demolished and my head uh, came to an instrument and I suffered uh, my nose was, I have an artificial nose and it's quadruple of fractured head and, and vertebra broken and many things. So after having been five months hospitalized, I was well again spurred on by the only burning wish to continue as test pilot again. The multiple injuries, Hannah Reich flew to Pinamunda, but she had chosen a most unfortunate date. When I arrived there, just after having been recovered after my, my uh, accident with the rocket plane, I just arrived when in the first night was the horrible bombardment in Pinemundo. It was the first RAF raid on the secret establishment, causing considerable damage to the V-2 rockets and the living quarters of the scientists. But once again, Hannah Reicher's amazing luck had helped. I'm terribly ashamed that I must say I slept the whole night. They forgot I slept in the house where the, you see, there was Penimende West and Penimende East. In one was the development of Werner von Braun's V-2, and on West, we made, we wanted to make the V-1 um, and um, the rocket flights and other things were done there. But I uh, had my quarter in the in the house where the officers slept and when there was the siren, I didn't hear it. I slept so deeply and everybody thought, oh, the others had fetched Hannah. So I was quite alone in this house, sleeping deeply. I didn't hear anything about all. And the next morning, I was so ashamed when suddenly someone, I thought, oh, it's misty, but it was only smoke about all what was burning. And you see, the main, Attack was east, and I was in the west. It was some, not so near. Throughout the war, Hannah Reich remained a civilian, 
but she was personally awarded two iron crosses by Adolf Hitler. What were her impressions of the German leader? I can't judge how it was with Hitler in all other areas. I only can judge that in what he was interested about my doing and test flights, I was deeply astonished about his questions and his interest. 